Good morning. I assume that a lot of people realize that things are back on YouTube again. Um, so today we are going to get to what I think is at least one of the most useful things uh, from this course in practical reasoning is the uh, Kalman filter, which will be the focus for today and also most of the focus for next week and also the focus for a large part of assignment four. So that is a little bit setting the scene. Um, we'll get back to what that is. But first, we'll just talk about the concept of state-based models. In the uh, Marima approach that we looked at last week, basically what we assumed was that whatever system we had, we could observe all variables, all states directly with no noise. How many systems do you know where you can assess and measure directly everything with no noise? Anyone? So basically, what usually happens is that you have a process, as in the top X process up here, and then what you do is that you observe that process at some point in time. I don't know how many of you have a background in something that rel relates to physics. A little bit. Um, most of you have probably had an introductory course in physics. When you did models there, doing differential equations, you were making the models typically, I would postulate, in continuous time. Because it's much easier to describe these physical processes in continu continuous time. That actually holds for most also chemical, biological processes of various kind. They're much easier to describe because they do evolve in continuous time if there is a differential equation involved. So one of the nice things which we'll touch a little bit upon is, well, you can have the system described in continuous time, but 
as we also discussed very early in this course, you almost never observe a course, observe a system in continuous time. You sample it. So you have to somehow make a model that gives you from one point in time to the next point in time, either in discrete time space or in continuous time space. That's one of the things we'll discuss a little bit further today. But what we'll talk about is the, the concept of state-space models where we have a state model for the x is some function of the previous x's. Today we'll consider linear functions. Those are the easy ones. If you want to go for nonlinear functions, you should go for the advanced time series course. You can also have an input of some kind and some system noise. And then we have an observation equation down here, where you have a function of the input and then some observation noise. So in the Marina setting, this h function was just, the what was just observing x directly, and there was no noise. But that is, I mean, often you, can, you may be able to measure all states that you find are interesting, but you may not be able to measure them without noise. And even more often, you have states in the system that you do not observe. So this is one of the reasons why I, I like this. And there's other, another thing about it is that you can look at the noise for the observation part and for the system part. When you're doing things in a multivariate Marima setting, basically you assume that all the noise that is in there comes from the system. So that is, you can say, the, the purpose. And just some examples of models. I've used the example before. If you have a solid block of material and you want to consider the temperature inside that, but the only thing you can measure is the temperature on the outside. You can make an equation, a partial differential equation, to solve how is the, given how you change the temperature outside, how the, would the temperature inside change? And by measuring dot, just the temperature on the surface, you can say something, you know the relation to the inside. Another thing is a classical thing, actually not just the position of a ship, but I don't know how many of you have used, you can say, noisy measurements to give positions. I gave you some GPS data. Okay, yeah, what is your example? Indeed, those are noisy. Uh, I have colleagues that are working with combinations of that, actually. Um, so you can say that's not for a ship, typically. Some of these things could be. Um, the case that I know of is if you have underwater uh, robots that are going to navigate, it's quite important that you know where this robot is relative to the structure that you want to kind of do something with to not hit it. Uh, what they're doing, among other things, is, is to, um, when you have RL constructions underwater, sitting on the seabed, they want to figure out, I want to connect a pipe from this point to, say, that point. What is the orientation of the connection here and there? And what is the distance? And what is in between that I have to take care of? Because you're going to make a pipe, and when you come with it and put it into place, it should fit just nicely. To, know, to do that, you need to be able to navigate. You can do that with sonar, where you basically send out a, a sound signal and then receive something back. And if you do that to many points, you can kind of get an estimate of where you are. Um, what they do is also to combine it with some common filters, exactly, to say, well, we also have gyros and accelerations, so we know how we move relative to where we are. And the combination of those two things, that improves everything. So it's the ability to take, but I mean, all these things are observations of your position and your movements. But what you care about is where you are and how fast you're moving. So you're measuring sometimes something that is slightly different. Another thing is pharmacokinetics, pharmacodynamics, modeling how, whenever you take a drug of some kind, how is the 
kinetics of that, as in how is the you could say dilution diffusion into the body, and also how is the dynamics, which in PKVD modeling is how is actually the treatment working. So basically, you want the drug to, to be distributed where it was supposed to be active, and then you also want to kind of model how active is it where it is. But you cannot make samples everywhere in the body. What you will be able to is just to do maybe some simple blood samples somewhere. A classical example is when you're going to test uh, people for uh, um <coughs> it's a diabetes, you give them an injection in one arm of insulin or glucose, and then in the other arm you, you make blood samples continuously or almost continuously. And then you look at how is the body working as a system. Based on the response from the body, then you can say, well, how tolerant are you to glucose? And how can you regulate it? Those were just a, a couple of examples, um, and there are many more examples where you have a dynamical model, where you know there's noise into it, and you have some observations. And if you go back, you can say, if you're in a case where the system noise is next to nothing, and you just want to fit a model to this, then you can say this is the deterministic, and then this is something with just observation noise. Then you could do some DS squares regression. If indeed your model is perfect and there is no noise, it works okay. If your model is not perfect, you will create an error. Um, I won't illustrate that because it becomes a little bit technical why it goes out. But I'll, I'll try to do that at some point. Um, so, how to make a model structure? I kind of mentioned, uh, mentioned a little bit. Basically, what you want to do is to consider the physical system that you're describing. Can you list the equations of motion for the system? And then you have some differential equations. And one thing that is important to notice is basically what we did, you can take any univariate Marima model and write it as a multivariate AR1 model. I don't know if you recall that, but the same thing you can do with differential equations. I don't know how many of you have done that. To take a second order differ differential equation and write it as a bivariate or two-dimensional first-order differ differential equations. Has anyone not done that? Done that? Some, have, do, so, some do not remember doing it. <laughs> so how does that work? Well, there's also another thing which I mentioned just before. Typically, you have it described in continuous time as a differential equation, but what we want at some point is to get into discrete time. You can either do that by on the fly integrate from one sample to the next, but for linear systems, we might as well do that once and for all and get by with that. And one thing to note is when you do this, the parameters are not exactly the same, but of course there is a mapping from the continuous to the discrete time. So, if we continue, uh, start with the most simple example. What we want to do is to go from continuous time to discrete time. One of the most ex simple examples I can get up with is we have a system dx dt, which is equal to a times x. I assume that you all know the solution to this, right? The solution is that x as a function of t is equal to some x0, or I could also write it at x, ah, let's just write it like this, times the exponential of a times t, right? 
Now, what I want to do is to look at this as a discrete time process. So what happens if I go a little time step forward? So I want to solve this for time t plus delta t. Well, I can just plug delta t plus delta t in up here. So I get x naught exponential of a times t plus delta t. When I add exponents in here, well, I can just split it out and multiply them together. So I can write this as x naught, the exponential of a times t times the exponential of a times delta t. When you look at this, basically what you have here is just what you started off with up there for xt. So this is xt times the exponential of a times delta t. So what did we get to here? Well, if we want to get to xt plus 1 in a discrete time setting, what we needed to do is to multiply with this one down here. Now I just call it a tilde times xt, where a tilde equals the exponential of a times oops, delta t. That was not too hard, I guess. But basically, what we just postulated up there is in the continuous time system, you had the coefficient to be a. Now it's the exponential of a times the time difference between samples. So it's a different coefficient, but it's, of course, related to what is here. For the univariate case, it's not so much different. Now, to do the other part, how to go from a second order equation to a first order. Now I'll use a different notation for, dif I assume you have seen this, this before, x double prime as the second order differentiate of x of t equals a x prime plus b times x plus c. So what you do here in order to write this as a couple set of first order equations. Do you recall? Some of you said that you've done this before. Do you recall how you how to do that? I will introduce a variable y. What should I use for that? I need two states. Yes? Yes, so I'll call x prime, I'll label that y. Now I will write the system of equations such that I have x prime, y prime equals, now x prime, that is exactly equal to y. So that was easy. What is y prime equal to? Well, that's x double prime, and that is given up here. So that is just a times, well, x prime, that is y, plus b x plus c. And now, if you want to write this as you can say more on a state space form. What we would like to do, I'll take it on the next line, is to write it as a matrix times our state, x over y, plus some constants. Let's take the last bit out here first. 
That should be a zero because there's only a y up there, and down here we have a constant c. And then when we look at the first row here, we have just a y here, so we need a one there and a zero there. And then for the second row down here, well, for the x we have a coefficient b, and for the y we have a coefficient a. Right. So now we have a first order two dimensional system. I think you've seen something similar to this in mathematics too. But it may be a long time ago, so that's okay for a quick recap. So, if we have the linear stochastic state space model, as is the model that we're going to use here, then a definition is what we have up there that we say that we have the system xt and we equate it to a matrix A times xt minus 1. Notice one difference to what I did up here. Here I went from xt to xt plus 1. Here I write it from xt minus 1 to t. Of course they are equivalent, but whenever you're doing something, just keep track of did you add one or did you not add one to time? So which one is, well, on which side of the equal sign is t, and which one is t plus one and t minus one? Just so that you keep track of that. And then you add some coefficient on some input, and of course if there's no input to the system, you just cancel that out. And then you have some system noise, So this is the system state system. And then we have the observation part. We take yt equal some matrix C times xt plus e2 comma t. Be that the measure the observation noise. And we call the dimension of x the order of the system, and we as Pretty much always, we assume that these noise paths out here, they are mutually independent. And we just define what are the covariance matrices for the two different noise signals. And then, for now, we consider all these matrices known. Of course, the last bit is not going to be true in reality. But for now, to get started, that's how we will do things. One thing that is nice about the system is that it fulfills the Markov property, that all the information about the future is given in the current state. So you don't need to, as such, remember anything from the past. You just need to know where you are in order to predict the future. And you could say that these coefficients a, b, and c, they changed over time. That's perfectly OK, except for the case where A, B, and C depends on the state, because then it's not a linear system anymore. Then you're going not to what we'll, we'll get to here as a, a Kalman filter, but what's called an extended Kalman filter, which is what you do in the advanced time series course. OK, I don't know if you recall this slide. I've shown it at least twice before. <laughs> Air pollution in cities. We have the nitrogen oxide and dioxide. And here we have given a system description here. And the example that we used in the first lecture was to say, well, what is we only observe nitrogen dioxide? What do we do about it? Could we formulate this now on a state space form? Well, the obvious answer is yes, we can. What we do is to first remember the definition of the state that we actually did up there, that we always defined the first one as NO and the other one as N2, NO2. With those coefficients, if you only observe the second state, the matrix down here, we have one observation, 
So we should have one row in C. We should have two columns because x has dimension two. So we get zero one just to observe the second element. And the rest are just copies of the matrix from there. And now we've shown right now that there's no observation noise. Anyone who looked at real data from traffic data, you will be able to just, you can discuss. You have a lot of system noise, um, but you also have observation noise of some kind. But this is just to say you can actually take what we did previously and map it here and say that there's no observation noise. Then it kind of fits. And the nice thing is, as we did previously, is that you, well, given observations of just the one state, you can actually get some information about the other. I don't know if you remember how we reduced the variance, quite substantial. And the reason for that is that the noise part here, those two states are having a very high correlation. So, what we'll use as an example, pretty much for the rest of this lecture, is a system of this kind, where we have a falling body. Need something that doesn't make marks in the floor. Basically, what you have, it starts somewhere, has an initial position and initial velocity, and then I guess you can all remember that gravity will kind of bring that down. As this. So it's a fairly simple example of the second order differential equation that we have up there. So, how do we do this? Well, we'll do as we just did up here. We will define our system. Oh, let me just do it over here. We'll define our system as a bivariate system where the first state is the position and the second state is the velocity. And what we observe is just the position in this case. So if we were to write it sort of like what we have up there, how would we write that? We could write it in the continuous time description as we have over here. Or we could go for the, you can say, discrete time version of it. Here is the continuous time, but basically what we have to do is to go here and identify that, well, this matrix in the system, we only have a constant C, both A and B are equal to zero. So there's a row of zeros down here, and here should be minus G. I just took, rather than writing minus G, I wrote a minus one there and had G as an input, but it's equivalent to the notation from over here. Now, let me just change this. Given that we have this, what we need to do is to solve the system. So we have it as a continuous time system here. And if we want to solve this, well, we know the solution to a falling body, right? So we don't have to focus too long time on this formulation because we know that it's minus one half times the acceleration times the time spent square plus the time times the initial velocity plus the initial place. That is the solution for the position and the solution for the velocity is minus the acceleration times, well, the acceleration times time plus the initial velocity. I hope you can all remember that as a solution 
to this equation up there. This was basically just to kind of to get over to the state space form. But if we take it from there, how to proceed? Well, we'll do just as we did in a univariate case. We will just look at what happens up there when we change time. So if we say that we will sample this system, and we say that time 0 as an initial time is k minus 1 times t, where t is the sampling time, and t is then k times t, because then t will be k and k minus 1, where here I use subscript t and t plus 1. But not to confuse things, I'll use k as my discrete time rather than t. And just to make things easy, I'll choose the sampling time to be 1. So if I do this, what do I get? Well, the first thing to do is basically to take the system up there and then just write, what do we have? So we have x1, x2 at ah, kt, because it's at time t. Well, that is equal to minus g half times, well, t minus t naught is equal to k minus 1 t. Oh, sorry, wrong. t minus t naught, what is that? t, exactly. So what I get is times t square. And then I have a t minus t naught, which is again t, times x2 at time t naught, which is then k minus 1 times t. And then the last bit is plus x1, k minus 1 times t, parentheses close. Now, for the second state, what we have is that we have minus g times t minus in naught, that is again t, plus x2 of t naught, which is x2 of k minus 1 times t. So this is our system. Well, we define t to be 1. So let's make life a little bit easier. And then we will say that we're going to discrete time. So we'll change the notation a little bit and say we have x1, x2 at time k. And then if we just look at this, we have minus g half times t square, doesn't give anything, plus x2 at time k minus 1, plus x1 at time k minus 1. And then for the second state, we have minus g times t. That is just g plus we have x2 at time k minus 1. And now we're getting close, because now we can kind of write it on the form where we just have the updated state is equal to a matrix 
times the state at the time before, x1, x2 at time k minus 1, plus some vector with coefficients times the input that I'll just pick as g to make it similar to what I did before. And let's start from the end again. Well, the constant that we have up here is minus g half. So that's minus a half here and a minus 1 down here. <coughs> and now we get to this part over here. Well, what do we have for the x1 state? We have x1 plus x2. That gives us a 1 and a 1. For the x2 states, it's just x2 as it was before. OK, so what is the intuition about what we get out here? The intuition is that x2, describing the velocity, is the velocity it was before. That's the expectation, with a small change from the acceleration. And the position is the position it was before plus the velocity per time per sample. That's the definition of the velocity here is per time step. Now the time step is one second. So you can say if I use per sample or anything else, doesn't make a big difference. Multiplying by one is always easy. If I go back one slide, yes? Yeah, so if I, if I say k minus parentheses k minus 1, then I get a plus 1. Yes, yes, and the t goes outside the parentheses. Then you say k minus k minus 1 minus k plus 1. Well, I mean, I just took, took the t outside the parentheses. But that doesn't make a difference. <laughs> Does it make sense? <laughs> what I just wanted to, to do was to get back to the continuous time description of the system here. Now you can say the coefficients in this system are fairly simple, because we just have ones and minus one. We have a one there and a minus one there. But when we look at it in a discrete time setting, all of a sudden we go from two parameters here that are different from 0 to 5. Just because we go from continuous time to discrete time. And it's generally the case that you will have more parameters in play when you do things in discrete time. If you take a continuous time system and convert it to discrete time, <coughs> you will have a more complex representation. So if you were to estimate parameters, and you formulate it in discrete time without having the relation back to continuous time, you will have to identify five values different from zero. If you knew that this would be a zero, up, I mean, up front. It's much nicer if you can represent the system like this and then translate it. And then if you can say, I like noise. So most systems would also have a noise component uh, in it somewhere. So we'll just take the system that we just derived and add a little bit of noise to it. So are we happy now? Well, reasonably happy. Now we have described the system. Now we have done, we took some physics and we wrote it as a system. So, what is an example? What we have to do is to predict the future of this falling body, given some measurement of the time k. That's similar to what we've done previously in, in the arm arena settings. We also have to say, well, given what we have served, what is the 
best estimate that we have of where we are right now, given that we have served the current state. We have also done something similar to that, but for simpler systems. Last but not least, you can also say, well, given that I've served the system up to now, I want to estimate somewhere in the middle, how can I actually use both observation before and after to get a better estimate of where I actually was at the time. That's called interpolation or smoothing. Um, I won't spend much time on this. Basically, what you do is that you run the filter that we get to forward to get the information from the previous observations, and you run it backwards to kind of use the information from the future observations. But what we will focus on is to look at the prediction of the future and the reconstruction of the current. So always saying, what is the best estimate given the information that is available until now? Before going into the actual case, there's one requirement that we just have to kind of touch upon. That is the so-called observability. I just postulated that I did not have to observe every single state here. I could just observe some of the states. Of course, if I observe of none of the states, I cannot say anything. If I observe some states, but there are other states in the system that are not somehow connected to the to this state that I observe, then I will not be able to give any meaningful estimate of what I did not observe. So you need a restriction on how much do you need to observe in order to actually have an observable system. And the definition is that the rank of this matrix here has to equal the rank of xt. And now what is this? Take the rank. If a matrix has full rank, it means that you can say they are all linear independent. You take C transpose. Well, that's an easy one to do. Then the next element is C times A transpose. And you keep doing that up to the order of the system, minus 1. Our system that we have down here is a second order system. So what we have to look at in the particular case In the particular case, we have to look at C transpose, which is, if you go back a couple of slides, C is 1, 0 in this definition because we only observe the position. So C transpose is a 1, 0. Then we need to have, as the next element C times A transpose. Let's just look at, this is the A matrix. And if we take C times A, basically, what do we do? We can do this two ways. We can either just calculate it as is, Take A and multiply on C. So C is equal to 1, 0. And then if you multiply A on this, what do you get out? I get the first element out there, right? If I multiply this and that, I get a column of ones. And now the question is, has this matrix full rank? Luckily, it does. So that is what we do. You can also kind of do with a QR uh, decomposition just to check the rank of something. Um, if you don't want to do it yourself, that's the R command, or you can also do other decompositions where you have to require 
full rank in, in order to get it. But we, at least in this case, it works out. We don't have to observe the velocity because it is connected. By this one here, it is connected to the um, position. Now, this is the definition of the Kalman filter. <coughs> I will spend quite a bit of time or some time on going through the different parts. Basically, this is just an algorithm to implement. And what happens whenever you're going to have an algorithm to run, you need to initialize it somewhere. So in the beginning of time, you need to know where you are. You need to know what is the associated uncertainty with where you are right now. That makes somewhat sense. And given the equations down here, it's obvious that the observation uncertainty, so you have the uncertainty related to the state or to the system, and then you have what is the uh, uncertainty related to the observation that you have. Well, you do not have, but you are predicting the uncertainty for the first observation. Well, why is this so? Well, basically, our observation is the state pre-multiplied by c. That gives us c times the covariance matrix for x times c transpose. That's the usual story. Plus the measurement noise, the covariance matrix from that, which comes from this epsilon here, or error term here. So, so this expression here is quite straightforward. I would also postulate that the prediction part, but I'll get back to it. What you have to do is predict one step forward in a system. Well, that's basically just to take the conditional expectation of the future given the current time. So basically, as we have always done, in, uh, in all the models we've done, basically the expectation of the noise is zero, so we just write the other parts in here. And for predicting the noise, well, you had some uncertainty on the state before. Now you multiply by matrix. So what you do is that you multiply by that matrix and post multiply by the transpose on the corresponding a variance, and then you add the uncertainty that comes, or the variance that comes from the system noise. And the equation for the observation noise down here is exactly the same as up there. It's just written down here for t plus 1 given t, and that is for t equals 0 up there. So you can say the tricky part is how to do the reconstruction part in here, because the rest are things that we have done many times. And by the way, uh, you can change the order of these two. You can start by predict and then reconstruct, then you just have to do things. But I will tend to just do it this way all the way through, but you can write it where you flip them. It doesn't make a difference. You just have to, whenever you've done a prediction, the next thing you do is to reconstruct. When you made a reconstruction, the next thing to do is make a prediction. And which one you do first doesn't matter so much, as long as you start with a appropriate initial values. So the reconstruction, I'll just say this very briefly, but I'll get back and discuss it in more detail. Basically, for the state, it is the pr prediction that you had, plus some correction that is relative to the observation that you got and the prediction you got for the observation, what is the prediction error? And then you have a multiplier, which we call the Kalman gain. Get back to that. That is the multiplier that we have here. It's defined as this up here, but I'll get back to that. And then for the uncertainty of the reconstructed, well, you had the prediction variance from down here. 
And then you have this factor on your um, bless you on your error. And well, when you take that on your error, this is a sigma y y. Then you have to pre and post multiply with that pre with the k and post multiply with k transpose. So this is not, and there are many ways of writing this particular equation with or without k, but you can find that in the book if you like. Um, just above the definition of the Kalman filter, you have different expressions for the variance part down here. So what we need to care about is the motivation for this k or the Kalman gain, which is also, in, in my view, you can say the core of this. I think now is the time to make a break. So let's just resume at 9 o'clock. <laughs>